My recording froze up again, so at least I caught it before I got too far. But we're gonna, this is going to be the result of a subsidy. And now, so we just found this, right? Cool. So now we wanna know the impact of this subsidy. So for that, again, we're gonna to have to alphabet soup this. Your letters can go in anywhere you want. And we can have no subsidy as our baseline. By the way, the reason why we weren't stable here or here was because this vertical gap was equal to twice the subsidy. So that meant we weren't stable. Consumer surplus, one. Well, consumers were getting this quantity, so this whole thing is their benefit. As we add up those vertical values there, they're giving up this much, and so their net benefit is A and C. Again, I'm not encouraging you to do this in your head like I am. I'm doing it because I have a small board to work with. How about those producers? Well, they're receiving exactly the amount consumers are handing over. And so they're getting D, G, E, and F. They're giving up F and G because we know that a supply schedule tells us marginal cost. And government, ooh, now we have to turn our brain on. Is government making money or spending money or not? Oh, neither, because there's no subsidy. So nothing. How about total surplus? A, D, C, and E. We just add those together. Okay. By now, hopefully, again, you can turn the crank reliably on that. Now the new piece, consumer surplus with the subsidy. Well, consumers are now getting this quantity here which means that they're getting benefit, 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 benefit. Ah, they're getting A, C, D, G, I, E, F, and J. And their total cost, well, if they're consuming this quantity, this must be their cost. So they're giving up E, F, and J for a net benefit here of A, C, D, G and I. Producer surplus. Hmm. Well, producers are producing this quantity, which means that has to be their benefit. So they're getting all of this in benefit. Uh, C, B, D, E, G, H, I, J, and F. Now they're only getting this much from those consumers. Where's the rest coming from? Oh yes, government. So that, by the way, is going to tell us that this is going to be negative. But we're not done here. We have to subtract out their total cost. We know that supply tells us marginal cost, so cost, 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 cost. So they're giving up F, J, G, H, and I. They're left with C, B, D, and E. Government too? Ooh, government is for this college degree is handing over this much. And no, not the whole amount because consumers are handing over this much. Government is handing over this much and producers are receiving that much. So if we add, so they're handing over that much for every unit that is sold and this many units are sold. So if we were to shade all of that in, we end up with a negative C, B, D, G, H, and I. And a total surplus here of, we add this, oh, we've got A, C, C, B, D, D, G, I, and E, right? How do we have double letters in, oh, here's where most people make a mistake. They've gotten out of practice because they're so used to this being zero that they don't remember that the total surplus is consumer plus producer plus government. And so we have to add in a negative here, C, B, D, G, H, and I. That C cancels a C, that B cancels the B, that D cancels one of the Ds, that G cancels that G, and that I cancels that I, and we are left with, ooh, we have to be a little careful here, A, C, D, E, minus H. Okay. Ooh, that's weird. 
Well, did we turn the crank right? We can go back and review. And yeah, we did. Change in consumer surplus is our new minus our old A, C, D, G, I. Again, because I'm looking at the impact of a subsidy, not the impact of eliminating a subsidy. A, C, D, G, and I minus A and C equals D, G, and I. Are consumers better or worse off? They're better off. Cool. This policy is working, right? Let's check the producers. So students are better off. Let's see if administrators and professors are better off. This is close to our hearts, I think. Let's see. C, B, D, and E minus D and E is equal to C and B. Hey, producers, faculty, administrators, and bureaucrats are better off. This is great. We found a way to generate value for society. So we took those resources in a way in the market, right? So we took those resources and transferred them over here. And yeah, there was that loss in well-being over there in the tax market from transactions that no longer take place, but we're able to make consumers improve. Oh wait, we don't pick sides, do we? What we care about as social scientists, we may care a lot as individuals about consumers and producers, but as social scientists, we care about society as a whole. So let's finish this out. The change in government is a, which again, we don't really, this is only, we don't care about this really. It's just that we have to remember that these resources are being expended and change in total surplus is our, oh crap, AC, D E minus H minus A C D and E. And this here cancels. And what are we left with? We're left with a negative H. So we destroyed value in the market where we taxed, whether that was a tax on labor or a tax on sales of goods. And what did we do? Somehow we lost value over here. Huh. But we have more people getting college degrees, right? We do. We have more people in seats. We have more chair. So how did we destroy? Hmm. Well, it turns out that we need now, what was the impact? Well, we had this increase in quantity, right? So let's figure out what the impact of that was. Well, what's the total benefit of those degrees? Well, the total benefit is given here. Who's getting the benefit? The consumers are getting the benefit, right? The students are getting the benefit. And so they're getting I and J out of those degrees. So are the, those extra degrees creating value in society? Sure, right? There is a value to more people being educated. But the issue, of course, is that along the way, we are taking resources from elsewhere in society and we're where they would have created value. So we're taking professors and administrators and buildings and projectors. Could we do something else with those if they weren't being used for university? Yeah. Do we know what that thing is? Well, no, because we're not doing it. But we know as a result of having these tools, we can actually get specific about what that value is. What is the value that we would be getting with the buildings and the, and the labor and the other things if we weren't using them to generate university degrees? Well, what tells us that? Our supply schedule, because the value that we give up is the cost. And so we are losing H, I, and J in value elsewhere in society. And so the net benefit to society of those additional degrees is an, oh, hey, yeah. And again, we could call this a dead weight loss in production because we're overproducing. Um, but basically, right, this is the result of having too many people going to college. But wait, this is a good policy. No, it's a bad policy. Again, unless there's something that we're missing from the point of view of society, from the point of view of myself as a professor. Oh, this is wonderful. Although I actually have some reservations about that. I'm not sure that this is good for me, but for professors and administrators particularly,
this is a good thing. But for society, it's bad. And so this is one of the other useful things with these tools. Again, it's bad unless there's something else that isn't on our graph that we're missing. But this is one of the beautiful things of these tools is I can see things that I otherwise wouldn't. Without these tools, all we end up seeing is, oh, this is helping me. I'm paying less for college or I'm, I have more resources, right? But this allows me to step outside of my preferences and start talking about society. Most of the time, discussions about policy end up being, I like it or it helps people I like, or I don't like it, or it hurts people that I like. That's a reasonable place to start, but if we're gonna start talking about society, we need to have some way of moving beyond our own situation and our own preferences. And so again, unless we're missing something, what this tells us is, should we subsidize higher education? No. Because we destroyed value in the market where we collected the resources, and not only did we not generate enough value to cover those extra costs or the value that we're giving up, we actually destroyed value here, <laughs> right? We took resources and moved them from higher valued uses where they would generate H, I, and J, and we moved them to areas where they generate lower valued uses. Now, one of the questions would be, what might be on our graph that we're not taking into account? It's a good, good question. What might be on our graph that we're not taking into account? Well, the most common thing that people oftentimes say is, right, the argument, the whole argument for college that I laid out in one of those early videos was, look, this makes people more productive. And that's true. But what represents the value of productivity? That there is the value of increased productivity. Because again, if, if you're more productive, is there a way you can keep the people who benefit from your productivity from, benefit, from, from getting it without you getting it? Yeah, you don't work for them. We, right, we've banned slavery in this country. We've de even banned indentured servitude in this country. And so, again, unless we want to countenance Slavery, right? If we had slavery here, if we had different rules in place, and again, I hope we don't even countenance that, but in that case, we might, right? Something might be different. But in this case, this represents the value of increased productivity. And so the argument for the thing that's not on our graph can't be the increased productivity. It has to be something else. Hmm. People make arguments that this, that, that more educated people are um, better citizens. I'm not sure that that, I think that's some fairly self-serving ideas because typically the people who are making those arguments are either the students or the professors. And rather than just saying, look, this policy helps me at the expense of society, we typically want to think that what is good for us is good for society. And what this tells us is, again, unless we're missing something, now, this brings us to another general point, which is we have a tendency as human beings to consider the strongest evidence in favor of our preferred position. We like evidence that says that we're smart and sexy and attractive and skilled and gifted. We don't like the evidence that says maybe we're flawed and maybe we make some mistakes and maybe we're, right? And so we tend to look for the strongest evidence in favor of our preferred position. But, and this could, this could be the other way too, right? We don't, if we're pessimists or depressed, we don't want to look at the strongest evidence that we are losers, etc., because our preferred position in that situation is that we are losers. And, or life is really grim. And so we want to look, consider the strongest evidence against our preferred position. Now, usually my experience is that for most people, the strongest evidence against our, typically we like things that make us look good, that make us correct. And so we want to probably consider the strongest evidence against our preferred position. For you as students and for me as a faculty member, I mean, I think we all like the idea that what we are doing here is good for society, right? Getting more education, sharing more education, trying to transform lives here. 
And so we probably want to consider the strongest evidence against our position. Now, this is different than the argument that we might want to provide differential liquidity, right? There's, there's an idea with subsidizing student loans that might be, well, look, you know, the poor and socially marginal don't have access to capital markets or to family members that can support them. And so they, there's a gap between their willingness to pay and their ability to pay. And so we might, that's the, that would be a reasonable argument if we, if we bought that, right, which I think there's some truth to that, uh, that we might want to have an intervention to subsidize the poor and socially marginal getting access to capital to go to college. Uh, because while that would have a distortionary effect, it might be counterbalanced by some social justice concerns. But subsidizing college generally, again, unless there's something that's not on our graph. Now, one of the arguments is, you know, that I've seen, there's, some, there's evidence that people with educations are, and they have uh, greater life expectancy, better health outcomes. Again, the problem is, which direction does causality lie? It may well be that going to college doesn't, I mean, doesn't make you a better citizen, doesn't make you healthier. It just reveals the underlying characteristics that were already there. And the people who are healthier uh, tend to make it, find it easier to get through college. Or the people who are good, I don't really, the evidence that people who, who um, go to college are better citizens, are more civically engaged, are... Um, that's really not there. It's not supported by the evidence that I've seen. But that's the sort of thing that we would have to argue for if we would argue for this being a good social policy. So then why do we have subsidies for higher education? Well, we have subsidies for a lot of things. And it turns out that these answers here give us, or these pieces here give us a hint as to what's going on. They give us a hint as to why subsidies are, are politically very popular. But they also tell us that unless there's something that we're not taking into account here, they're probably pretty socially disruptive and destroy value for us as a society. Not because we don't like college. This is, by the way, one of the other things that you'll, um, you'll hear, or maybe you're even reacting to out of this, is that right? this is one of the things that I find frustrating as an economist, is people sometimes walk away with the idea of, well, you don't like college. No, I clearly do. I clearly think this is an important thing. I've devoted my life to it, not just because it's a convenient and easy profession, because if you take it seriously, it's not. Now, if you're a shirker, then it can be. Uh, you have a lot of freedom. But um, that doesn't argue against this. I think college is very important, but that I'm able to hold two competing thoughts in my head. One is that this is valuable for society, but also that we probably shouldn't subsidize it. The same way that um, right? Do I hate the poor because I don't like rent controls? No, I, I think that rent controls are bad because they tip, I would expect that they disproportionately harm the poor and harm society as a whole. Now, the point of this isn't that you memorize the impact of subsidies and the impact of taxes. The point is that you have a set of tools to look at the issues and the policies that you find interesting and important. And my argument would be, hopefully, you see some way in which these tools gain you some insight. For example, here, without these tools, you know, I know, I'm able to see that there is value that we would get with the time, energy, and resources, the faculty, the administrators, the buildings, the groundskeepers, right? the campus security, the projectors. There's value that we would get if we were doing something else. I don't know what it is because we're not doing it. I have no idea what I would be doing if I wasn't teaching university. Now, I might be one of the people back here who has a relatively low opportunity cost of teaching university. And so I might be that I would still be produce, I, I would still be working at a university. I don't know. The point is, we don't exact, we don't know any of this because we're not doing it. But this still allows us to see things that other people don't see. It's too, it's getting too old for people to remember this reference. But, you know, I, I remember the movie, The Matrix, and it was a, you know, it's probably an old movie for you, but there's a moment in The Matrix where 
Neo starts, he sees things that other people don't. There's the bending the spoon and he's, there is no spoon. And he starts to just see these things that other people can't see. That's the way I feel about these tools. If you learn these tools, if you master these tools, you can see things and you can gain insight into the hidden order of the universe that other people can't. I argue that this set of tools and the insight you can gain is the closest thing to a superpower that we as a human species have come up with outside of the movies and outside of books, at least that you're going, that most of us, that anybody can access. Some people are close to superpowered in terms of certain areas like you know, playing basketball or other things, but this is a set of tools that with some reasonable effort, all of us can wrap our heads around to gain insight into the invisible, this, it's not invisible, it's just hidden. We don't see it without these tools. So taxes, subsidies, price ceilings, price floors, we could look at other policies, uh, we could look at price supports, uh, we can apply these tools to international trade, we can apply them to a whole bunch of other things, um, and some of those we will apply these to uh, in subsequent uh, modules. Okay. That's it for subsidies.